Hello and welcome back. This is Jonathan Gardner covering Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics. You can find a link in the description below to buy that on Amazon through an affiliate link that will kick back some bucks to me to support my channel. Today we are covering section thir or section one of chapter 13. Chapter 13 is in part four, which is called miscellaneous. So other things that are very interesting that are typically taught in a pre-calculus course. And in this section, we're going to talk uh, in depth about what a function is, okay? And he gives a definition here in the beginning, but he refines this definition throughout this section. So um, I'm going to give a definition or a proposed definition for a function. This is not what a function actually is, okay? So a function that's defined for all numbers is an association which each number is mapped to another number which we're going to call f of x, okay? So we take some number x, something happens and we get some other, maybe the same number, maybe not, that is the function. And this mapping is the actual function itself. And we've talked about mappings in geometry, but now we're talking it as part of functions, okay? So we call f of x the value of the function at x, okay? Uh, you might also think of this as the image of the x under f. Harkening back to previous terminology that we use for functions and things like that. Okay? So as an example, let's suppose that we had this function. So we had the function f that takes any value x and it squares that. Okay? So we might call this function the square. Right. Another example, we might have the function g that takes x and maps that to x plus 1. Okay. We don't have a special name for this, but you can call that probably add 1 or whatever you want to call it. Okay. And when we use these functions, right, we would say f of, in the book he has 2, so 2 squared is 4. Okay, g of, let's say, 1 is equal to 1 plus 1, which is 2, right? And we can do this for every value of possible value of x, not just integers, not just rationals, but irrationals as well, okay? Another function that you might have heard of, if you especially watched the last couple of videos, is the function called sine. And what sine does is it takes some value x and it maps it to the sine of that x. So sine itself is a function, okay? And um, there's not much more to say on that, but we've already seen functions, we've already used functions, and functions are our friends. So today we're gonna talk more about the property of functions and how they behave and what we can do with them, okay? There is a function that is very useful, it's called the constant function. Okay, we're going to need this when we want to do things with functions. And what a, fun what a constant function does is it takes x and it maps it to some constant value c. Okay, for all x. Okay. So we call this the constant function with value c, right? Now, we're going to run into problems. What if you wanted a function, let's say you wanted a function that took the square root. Let's use a different color. Let's use red. I'm going to use red for a while. So we want to take x, and then we want to take the square root of x, okay? The problem with this is that you, can, you only know how to take the square roots of numbers that are greater than zero, or equal to zero, right? So now we're going to refine the definition for function, is we have to define the set, right? So we say there's some s set s that the x must belong in in order for the function to be work. So in order the function to work, right? So we will say a function defined on f, on s. Okay? Or we might say for all values in s. Okay? So in this case, for this one, we would say that x is in, is greater than or equal to 0 for this function, right? So we, 
will not consider what happens when we pass in negative numbers to the square root function. Okay, so not much more to say there. There's another example of a function that we would require a limited number of values. So x could be defined as 1 over x, but x cannot be equal to 0 for this function. So all values for x except x equals 0 would work for that function. Okay. Um, what about, now do we, do if we had another function, let's say we had this function x that raises x to the power of some n, right? In this case, every value of x would work for that. Um, x, if x was 0, we would just get back 0. If x was some other number, then we could raise that to some power. So it, this is a function defined for all x, okay? So all x in r. Okay, in the real number set, that works. Okay. Now, he's going to talk, this is a little bit, when I first read this section, I was a little bit confused. I had to read it three or four times to understand. Okay. Oftentimes, you'll hear us say, us mathematicians or physicists, let f of x be such and such a function. Okay, right? So we'll say let f of x be, you know, the function x squared or something like that, right? This isn't quite right, right? What we really should do is add in here some terminology so that it is a proper description of a function, okay? So we should say let f of x be a function whose value at x is some such and such, okay? That's the proper way to describe a function. We describe a function by what the value is for each of those things, well, not by the formula that gives you the function, uh, because the formula is separate from the function. Uh, here's an example of a function that we, would, we should define properly. So let's use this lime green again. So we're going to say, let g be a function such that, such that, g of x equals 0 if uh, x is rational and g of x is equal to 1 if x is irrational. Okay, so this is a proper function. Even though I can't even write a formula for how this function would work, uh, we do know how to use this function. So for instance, g of 2, well 2 is rational, so that's 0. Right, um, g of two thirds as well is also equal to zero. Same for g of negative three fourths is equal to zero. But g of the square root of two is equal to one, and g of pi is also equal to one because those are irrational. Okay. All right. So the proper description for a function is not the formula that we often plug into the function, but the rules for how we map the values x into the result that we get when we, uh, the image under that function or the, the value at x for that function, okay? Let's talk about composing functions together, putting them together to make new functions. So we often add functions together, okay? So as kind of a shorthand, we will rewrite the sum of two functions in this way, okay? Or you might even see like f plus g. Right now, the important rule here is that x must be in the same set. For f and g. G. So if f only operates on positive numbers and g operates on all numbers, we're going to have a problem because it, it, this won't be defined for functions for values that are negative, right or zero. Okay, and we can apply uh, associativity. Right, so we might know that f plus g plus h, well that, that can be f plus g first plus h, or that can be f plus g plus h first. So we're going back to our basic rules for how numbers work. This harkens back to the same conversations we had. Now, keep in mind that in this section, he's only considering numbers, like real numbers. He's not considering other exotic numbers or geometric shapes or things like that. So we're only considering numbers here. Okay, and of course we have commutivity as well. So f plus g is going to be the same as g plus f. Okay, all right. 
And as an example, he has, let's suppose that we had f is defined such that x, x squared, f of x is x squared for all values of x, and g of x is simply sine of x for all x. Okay, and so if we had f plus g, that's going to be the function, um, let's put x in here, then this is going to map into x squared plus sine x for all values x inside that function. Okay. Uh, for instance, if we were to pass in pi as a value, then we would get pi squared plus sine of pi. Sine of pi is just zero, so that's the same as pi squared. Okay. That's an example of how you would evaluate that for pi. All right. We also have a zero function, which we'll conveniently use a symbol zero for. Okay, such that f plus zero is equal to zero plus f is equal to f. And so the zero function is just zero for all values of x. So zero of x is just zero. Okay, that's the definition of the zero function. Um, we have the uh, inversion. We can take, we can define minus f of x to be the negative of whatever that is with the result that f plus minus f is equal to zero. Okay, let's put a parenthesis around here. So the minus function is defined to invert the sign of all of the results, right? We can also do products. So we can say f of x times g of x is the same as f g of x, right? So we'll just talk about f g as the product of two functions. Okay. And we notice that if we had 1 times f, that's the same as f. If we had 0 times f, that's equal to 0, right? This is pretty obvious and straightforward. We can distribute. So if we had f plus g times h, all applied to x. Remember, these, all these functions have to have the same um, set of possible input values. Well, let's, we can rewrite this as f plus g of x times h of x right and so that will be f of x plus g of x times h of x okay and now we're just using standard you know distributed power because these are each of these are real numbers so we have f of x times h of x i'm sorry there's supposed to be a dot there not a parenthesis plus g of x times h of x so this is the same as f h of x plus g h of x using this definition up here and then that is going to be the same as f h plus g h of x rather trivial to show that these two things are equal so we can say using functions those two things are equivalent they're the same all right uh, typically when we are using functions um, we're converting uh, one quantity in terms of another, okay? And he gives a couple examples here. So he is going to write a function p that will basically take the year and convert that to the population, right? So it's defined, this is the population of the United States in that year, obviously. So he has p of 1800 is equal to 7.2 times 10 to the sixth, right? And p at 1900 is 76 million, 76.0 times 10 to the sixth. And then he has p at 1940 is 140 million. And the population of the United States in 1970 is 200 million. Okay, and this book was written in the 70s, so he doesn't have any further data beyond this point. Now, is there a like a formula that relates these two numbers? No, this is just translating the year into the population of the United States at that year. Okay, so we don't know what the population will be in the future. So we can't put things down from years that we haven't yet seen. Uh, another um, function that he comes up with is S, and this is defined by taking the year, and this is the 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 subway fare 
the price in cents of the subway fare. Price of subway fare in New York City, right? And so S in 1950 is equal to 15 cents. S in 1969 is equal to 20 cents. And S in 1970 was equal to 30 cents, okay? There was a lot of inflation back then. So again, this is another function that just helps us uh, correlate the year to the price of something in that year, okay? All right, exercises. Um, the exercises up until number, number eight is really interesting. Um, so I did mention briefly about even and odd functions, okay? But number eight is super interesting. You should do that. Number nine, okay, let's talk about number nine. Number nine looks confusing, it's really not. Okay, so in number nine, he says, show that any function defined for all numbers can be written as a sum of an even function and an odd function. So you can take any function that for all numbers and you can rewrite that as an odd function plus some even function. Okay, so we're supposed to show that this can be done. Okay, and he says, hint, you can use for your even function this function. Okay, f of x plus f of minus x all over two. I'm leaving as an exercise for you to guess what the odd function should be. And we know that this is an even function because when we plug in minus x for this, we're gonna get f of minus x plus f of minus minus x, which would just be f of x over two. And you can see that these two are actually the same if you just rearrange the terms a little bit, okay? So what should the odd, odd function look like and what happens when you add these all together? Do you get back o plus x plus e plus x is equal to f of x, okay? That's number nine. Okay, number 10 uh, is pretty easy. You just have to think about these functions and how they behave. You might have to use some trigonometric identities. Uh, number 11, show that the sum of odd functions is odd. So if we have f and g are odd, and what does that mean? Odd means that if you take the minus x, that's gonna be the same as minus of the positive x, right? And so same for g, okay? So what happens when you take f plus g of minus x, okay? Do you get minus f plus g? Do you get f plus g? That's something you need to figure out. Same for 11b, 12, a, b, and c, following the same pattern. So if we have an odd function, times an odd function, so we have f g of minus x, what do we get back, okay? If these are odd functions, what happens to that minus sign? I'm not gonna do any more than that, just giving you guys a hint on how to solve those problems. They're very interesting. I think section one is a good start to functions. Uh, hopefully you guys will have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below. Have a great day and bye-bye. Thank you for watching this video on Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics. You can find the series on the left and on the right, you can click to support my channel. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.